It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Good morning. <laughs> Speaker, my first question uh, this morning is for the Premier. You know, it's been two months since this, uh, or sorry, two weeks since this government uh, announced uh, opening plans and forgot to mention anything about schools. For over a year, this government has ignored and dismissed the concerns about the necessity to get our schools safely open. And it's clear, based on media reports, that this government uh, was was not planning at all, had no plan except for polling, and they have no plan now. So my question to the Premier is, is it really the case that this Premier is making decisions about the well-being, the mental, emotional and physical well-being of our children based on political polling instead of pediatric advice? To reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we uh, we're, uh, we're concentrating on uh, on on students and uh, and their educational success even before the pandemic started. But uh, as the pandemic uh, uh, raged on through the province of Ontario through the first wave, of course, we worked very hard to ensure that uh, kids could return to school last September. Uh, in a safe fashion, and I'm quite proud of what our educators uh, were able to accomplish. Not only just the educators, Mr. Speaker. While I have the floor, look, I'll, I'll, I'll say a big thank you to uh, Ms. Greco, uh, uh, to Ms. Shapiro, my, my teachers, uh, teachers for my two uh, two daughters. But not only the teachers, the maintenance workers, the principals, the administrative staff who have made our schools some of the safest schools in the province of Ontario. Uh, through September. Now, Mr. Speaker, let's remember that it was the opposition who did not want our kids to return to school, uh, in-person school in September, Mr. Speaker. We knew parents did. Response? That's why we've had the option for in-school as well as, as online. It's been very successful, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we will continue to put the needs of students first. Supplementary question. Well, speaker, <laughs> we all know that Ontario is the only province in Canada without kids in school. And there's a reason for that. It's not an accident. This government walked us right into the third wave, ignoring the advice of experts. They attacked critics who were working so hard to demand safer school for our kids. And in fact, as we just found out the other day, they were claiming that there was no spread of COVID-19 in schools, even though all along they knew that wasn't the case. Kids in the classroom were supposed to come first. That's what was supposed to be the priority. Does the Premier accept any responsibility whatsoever for the fact that children in Ontario are the only Question. kids in the entire country that are not back in their classrooms? And the government has figured. Of course, the, the Leader of the Opposition uh, uh, did not want kids to return to school in person at all. Mr. Speaker, you recall uh, uh, last September, uh, the leader of the opposition, the official opposition, was not in favor of a return to, to school, uh, in-person learning for our students. We knew that that had to happen. That's why we made serious investments in ventilation. That's why we ensured that there was additional staffing, there was additional maintenance workers to ensure that the schools were safe, uh, and that was done remarkably well. It's not a hallmark of the government. We put the resources in place, yes, but it is the hard-working teachers, it's the hard-working uh, uh, staff, it's the boards of education who work very closely with us work with the Chief Medical Officer of the Province of Ontario, work with the Chief Medical Officers uh, of Health in, in the different uh, 34 public health units, made sure that a return to school was safe, Mr. Was safe, Mr. Speaker, and it has gone very well. Of course, the opposition did not want that. They're never ones to want to listen to what parents, uh, uh, parents want, certainly never putting the needs of students first. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, not only because it's the right thing to do now, Mr. Speaker, but it's the right thing to do for the future of the Province of Ontario. The final supplementary. Uh, this Premier has never actually done what was the right thing for the people of Ontario during COVID. He never had a plan for kids in the classroom. Speaker, clearly, two weeks ago, there was no plan. He announced a re reopening and left families and kids and teachers hanging. There was no mention of schools. It was clear when he spent the last year claiming that schools are safe, when in fact they knew that that wasn't the case. And it was clear when the science table was literally screaming recommendations at the government about reopening too fast, which they just simply ignored and created this brutal third wave that we're now dealing with. 
all of the experts, uh, speaker, experts from Sick Kids, experts from CHEO, from the Canadian P Pediatric Society, say this, and I quote: "Kids have." suffered immeasurably over the course of the pandemic. The benefits of a few weeks in Question. the classroom cannot be overstated. That's what the experts say. Why doesn't the Premier care about the emotional, physical uh, and mental well-being of the children of Ontario? Uh, is the Leader of the Opposition really truly listening to herself when she asks these questions? I am a father of two kids who are both in school, who are both learning online. Is she really suggesting? Is she really suggesting that somehow I, as a father, and those of my colleagues here who are also parents who have kids in school, somehow don't care about children? It is preposterous, Mr. Speaker. What we have done since the beginning is ensure that the resources were in place to get our kids into school safely, Mr. Speaker. And we know it has been difficult. Not only difficult for all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, difficult for our small, medium, and large job creators, but extremely difficult for our for our youngest uh, Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. They are the future of the province of Ontario. They are the ones who will be sitting in this place when we are long gone, paying for the decisions that we have made today, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have ensured that our schools Spons. are safe. That's why we ensured last September that they went in school, even though it was the Leader of the Opposition who suggested that they should stay home. When the Chief Medical Officer of Health was saying, send them to school, we said yes. They said no. We won't listen to them, Mr. Speaker. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, my next question is uh, for the Premier, but I think it's pretty clear that actions speak louder in wor than words in terms of this government's uh, uh, behaviour. It's been clear for over a year what was needed in our schools, what was needed to be done to keep our classrooms safe. Bring class sizes down to 15. Get rid of the backlog of repairs that have been hanging over since the Liberals were in charge. Vaccination testing, vaccination of, uh, of teachers and education workers, and widespread testing in our schools. Working with education workers, and instead, what did we get? The Ford government cut the education budget. The Ford government attacked teachers and education workers. The Ford government failed to conduct any, any effective testing that would have given them information about the spread of COVID-19 in schools. And of course, they claimed that there was no spread, even though they knew that wasn't the case. Question. So my question is, will this premier answer my question? Will he admit that his failures have led to the fact that Ontario is now the only province in our country that doesn't have kids back in the classroom. I, I think uh, the people of the province of Ontario will recall quite uh, clearly that it was the Leader of the Opposition who, in September, asked us not to send kids back to, to school. And we said, no, we have to have that done, Mr. Speaker. We knew how important it was to the youngest Ontarians that they continue their education, but also to give options for parents, Mr. Speaker, so that they could learn at home if that was what they felt they needed to do. So we put that in place, Mr. Speaker. We ensured that there was uh, repairs to ventilation. We ensured that there were uh, hunt thousands of, of additional staff brought into boards across the province, additional thousands of additional teachers, hundreds of additional maintenance uh, 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 workers, Mr. Speaker, to keep our, our schools safe uh, and, uh, and to ensure that there was safety in the schools. We brought in testing. Uh, 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 for students, Mr. Speaker. We have done all of that so that our kids could continue learning. So we understand how important it is and how difficult this has been. That's why we've put additional resources in for mental health, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to do that, and we will ensure that kids have the best quality education possible. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, tragically, uh, the schools uh, and the kids not being in classroom is only the latest example of this uh, premier and this government's failure when it comes to the response of COVID to COVID-19. They ignored. Uh, as we know, warnings that uh, kept kids out of the classroom. They ignored warnings that led to 4,000 seniors losing their lives in long-term care. They ignored warnings in February that marched us right into this brutal third wave that we've all been trying to deal with every step of the way. They've ignored the warnings, they've denied the facts, and they have put politics ahead of people. 
Why was this government focused on protecting the king instead of protecting the people of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, I think that question really speaks for itself, and I think it really underlines why it is that the NDP Order. have never been given the confidence of the people of the province of Ontario to form a government but one disastrous time. A disaster that led the former NDP Premier to Order. abandon his own party for another party, Mr. Speaker. What Order. this Premier has done, what this government has done, is focus on the, on the people of the province of Ontario, keeping them safe, Mr. Speaker, right from day one. Even before the pandemic hit, Mr. Speaker, we were working on long-term care. We were working on health care, increasing health care capacity, Mr. Speaker. We knew that we had to bring in more staff. We knew that we needed more ICU capacity. We were working on that in advance of the pandemic, despite the fact that at every single time that opposition voted against those investments, Mr. Speaker, because Response. what it is is, is is you have to plan before, during and after. We have done that, and when we come out of this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we will lead the nation in economic growth like we did before the pandemic. The final supplementary. Speaker, teachers and parents and kids are exhausted. They're stressed out. There has been year after year of unpredictability, of disruption and uncertainty in our classrooms. Teachers, education workers and parents have all gone above and beyond during this pandemic. All deserve, all of them deserve a government that prioritizes the mental, physical and emotional well-being of the children of this province, but that's not what they've seen from their government. Why? Government House Leader. Speaker, since day one, since we were elected, we knew that we had to make some serious changes in the province of Ontario. That is why the people of the province of Ontario entrusted us to make those changes. When it comes to education, Mr. Speaker, we started right away. We looked at those math scores and we knew we had to do something different. We looked at the science scores. We knew we had to do something different. That's why we started putting resources into those areas so that we could improve outcomes for our students, Mr. Speaker, and we saw that. We knew that as the pandemic was hitting that we had to take action to get our kids back into class as soon as possible, but we couldn't do that without making investments that, unfortunately, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP during a minority, did not do, Mr. Speaker. The, the House Leader for the Liberals might Order. find it funny that his government never invested in schools. He might find it funny that they closed 600 schools. Spons? The parents of the province of Ontario don't find the failures of the Del Duca uh, win government funny, Mr. Speaker. We will get the job done for the future generations of Ontarians who will be sitting in this chamber making decisions for future <laughs> Order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, with only three weeks left in the school year, Sudbury's parents, students, and educators are anxiously waiting for the Conservative government to make a decision about reopening schools. Experts like the Council of Ontario Medical Officers of Health and the Hospital for Sick Children are supporting in-person learning. Public Health Sudbury and District said, I'm quoting here. PHU is prepared to support schools to transition as quickly as possible to in-person learning and to lead effective case and contact management should COVID-19 cases emerge in our schools in the month of June. My question through you uh, to the Premier is, will the Premier follow expert advice? Will he listen to parents, students and educators and reopen Sudbury schools to in-person learning for the remainder of the school year? The Government House Leader. We will continue to do what is best for the people of the province of Ontario and put our students first, Mr. Speaker. That's what we have been doing since day one. Not only during the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, but as I just said, when we were elected, we knew we had to do better for our students. And that is why we set out to increase scores in math and sciences, make those important investments in rebuilding some of the schools, Mr. Speaker. I just talked about the 600 schools that the previous uh, uh, Del Duca Wynn Liberal government closed in the province of Ontario. We started to make changes. When it comes to the pandemic, I can assure the member opposite, the people of Sudbury, what we will do is put students first. We will put the health and safety of our students first, Mr. Speaker. That has been our priority since September. Since September, when the NDP were calling us to leave kids home, we chose to do it, go down a different path, keep our schools safe, hire uh, thousands of additional Response. teachers, hire additional people to keep our schools clean and safe for students. That will remain our number one priority. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. And it's back to the Premier. Just to clarify, Speaker, what we stood for was having students come back not in crowded buses, not in crowded classrooms, and with full ventilation. <laughs> and that's where they dropped the ball on health and safety for our children. Mr. McIntyre is a music teacher. He's been juggling a hybrid model of learning for his music class, Speaker. He told me, trying to teach a classroom of in-class music students while also trying to instruct online learners is almost impossible. The in-class students progressed quickly, they received instant feedback every day, and became excited and actively engaged in music. Meanwhile, the distance learners quickly became disengaged. They often wouldn't submit assignments. They developed a negative attitude towards music and towards education in general. Speaker, the Premier has a quarter of a year, a three-month window to ensure that all education workers in Ontario have their vaccinations before school resumes in September. My question through you to the Premier is, will the Premier prioritize first and second dose vaccines so that education workers are completely vaccinated before September 2021? Thank you, Speaker. And to respond, the government has well, the member opposite would know that, of course, we already have, Mr. Speaker. But here is the problem with the NDP. You hear it in that question again, Mr. Speaker. The NDP, of course, always look short term. I'm not going to say that we're going to fix the entire education system in three months, Mr. Speaker, because we started in 2018, Mr. Speaker. Order. You don't just do it in two months like the NDP are suggesting. We knew that when we got into office back Leader in of the opposition, come to order. we had to make serious investments because our students because our students were falling behind. I don't want my children suffering because of the decisions or lack of decision making by governments, governments that I'm a part of, Mr. Speaker. That's why we made these important Waterloo, investments. That's why we've done everything that we could to keep kids in school since September, Mr. Speaker. It was them who voted against it. They voted against those investments. They wanted students at home, Mr. Speaker. We wanted better for our students, and we made sure the resources were there. So, just a, a friendly reminder to the House. When, when you ignore the Speaker's call to order, the Speaker has no alternative but to move to warnings. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, the Moving Ontario's More Safely Act passed third, read third reading in the legislature by a near unanimous vote. This bill, also known as the Moms Act, aims to combat stunt driving and other aggressive forms of driving on our roads. Speaker, this legislation also introduces measures to protect vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and highway workers, improve truck safety, and strengthen provincial oversight of the towing sector. Could the Minister of Transportation please tell us why the MOMS Act is so important to get into place now? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville for the question. Speaker, there's always more that we can do when it comes to road safety, and the MOMS Act is a big step forward. This past year, with fewer cars on the road, we've seen an uptick in dangerous driving. Earlier this week, a 23-year-old driver in York Region was caught driving more than 202 kilometers an hour in a 60 zone and charged with stunt driving. Mr. Speaker, needless to say, instances like this are unacceptable, and I am so relieved that no one was harmed. The Moms Act will send a strong message that those who don't play by the rules will face tough consequences. Speaker, our goal is to protect law-abiding road users while cracking down on bad actors, and I'm confident that this bill is a means to do that. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your response. Mr. Speaker, it's safe to assume that each one of us in the legislature have also seen similar instances of stunt driving. And we, this has been right across the province. It's extremely alarming. Could the Minister tell us why she's confident this legislation is the right one to protect road safety? Transportation. Thank you again to the member for the question. The Moms Act is not a one-and-done deal for road safety, but it's a big step of many more to come. Protecting road users is a priority for all of us here in this chamber, and I am very pleased with the support that this bill has received. When we brought the Moms Act forward, OPP Commissioner Thomas Creek said that the Moms Act is, and I quote, an important step towards addressing the serious road safety issues created by aggressive drivers. Our partners at the Toronto Police Service also support the Moms Act. Superintendent Scott Baptiste acknowledged that it, and I quote, creates a series of escalating sanctions for aggressive driving behaviors, focusing on the most significant repercussions on the most deserving, 
Unquote. Mr. Speaker, the work to keep our roads safe does not end here. Road safety is an ongoing priority because the costs of unsafe and aggressive Response. driving in Ontario are just too high. The next question, the member for Kiewetnaw. Uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier, Anawinagoma Egayat. Speaker, the discovery in Kamloops has caused great pain, but especially for residential school survivors and their families. Garnet Antikanep is an elder from Laksu First Nation and a survivor of the Pelican Lake Residential School near Sulaco. He said, uh, what happened in Cam Kamloops is a, is a validation of the things that we as survivors have been saying for many, many years, end quote. When we spoke, uh, he said that the survivors and their families need support. Mr. Speaker, uh, the discovery has um, opened many wounds. Healing initiatives and mental health resources are needed. What is Ontario doing to help support survivors and their families? To respond, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, and, and look, the, the member uh, uh, has been uh, uh, raising a number of very important uh, considerations uh, all week, things that I know that uh, uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs has been uh, has been seized with and working on uh, uh, with our partners uh, in Indigenous communities across the province of, of Ontario. I think it's it, it's also worth m mentioning that uh, this is something that uh, has been so important to Minister Rickford uh, long before he even became a uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, as having worked as a nurse in many of these uh, in many of the communities across the north, Mr. Speaker. But the member's right, work has to be done. It's not just about what we saw in Kamloops, as horrifically tragic as that is. I think what we have to to make sure that we do, and I know that this member is, it, it will not stop in his pursuit of making sure that his community and the Indigenous communities across the province of Ontario and Canada finally Response. get the resources that they need, not only from the provincial government but from uh, from the federal government. We have to make sure that this just isn't a temporary thing that we see because it's it, uh, highlighted in news stories across the country, but it is something that we once and for all take action on. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is back to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, we've heard um, commitments from this government this week, um, but we need we need a, an actual commitment to funding the programs and services, and like my colleague said, um, the healing um, supports that are needed in the communities right now. We need more than hollow words and broken promises and lowered flags and symbolic gestures. And, and frankly, Speaker, I, I don't know how we're supposed to believe the words of this government when they say that they're going to fund and support Indigenous communities through this tragic moment when we've watched them decimate and cut. We watched them obliterate the Indigenous Culture Fund. We watched them take Indigenous curriculum that was supposed to be embedded uh, in, the, in, the, in Ontario's curriculum about the history of residential schools. And they downsized that curriculum and made it elective. This government says that they'll work to never forget, but their actions say otherwise. Will this government reverse its decisions, make the teaching of residential schools mandatory at the elementary and secondary levels, and restore the Indigenous Culture Fund? Of course, Mr. Speaker, as I said, there's, there's obviously a tremendous amount of work that still needs to be done on this. I know, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the federal government will be uh, outlining its response to the uh, murdered and missing uh, uh, Indigenous women's uh, report. Uh, I know that we have, uh, have done, Minister uh, Dunlop did so uh, earlier, uh, or, uh, last week, Mr. Speaker, but there is a tremendous amount of work. Look, I'm not going to satisfy the member opposite or any of the Indigenous communities that are watching in, in a 60-second response in the, uh, in the chamber, Mr. Speaker. More work has to be done. But it's not just about what we saw in Kamloops, as horrifically tragic as that is. The members are raising points about finally addressing more than just that issue. It's about economic health of communities. It's about the spiritual healing of communities. It's about working together to find out what works best for our First Nations communities. Minister Rickford has been doing that since day one. Does more work have to be done? Absolutely. Have we made Response. good progress? Yes. Has this helped highlight, uh, has, out of this tragedy, have we highlighted across the country that more still has to be done? Yes, we will get it done, but I can't do it in a 60-second answer in the House. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough-Guildwood. 
Speaker, as this is my first opportunity to rise since the devastating news in Kamloops, BC, I do want to extend my condolences uh, to the Indigenous communities and um, the generational trauma that has been caused um, is just, it's, it's, it's time for Canada and Ontario to do better and that's what I'll, I will say, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This government has failed to create the conditions for reopening schools safely. Not only has this government shut down the economy and schools, but their lack of leadership and planning has resulted in a protracted debate about opening schools or patios, which should not be the case. Schools and patios are closed because this government has not planned and invested in the reopening. We need to see action. We need accelerated investments in ventilation, in teacher vaccination, in, and, and our education workers as well. We need PPE and a robust testing and contact Question. tracing program to manage the outbreak speaker. Teachers have heard every excuse under the sun as to why the Premier has not done his homework. It's time that the Premier does his homework and gets schools open safely now. Thank you. To reply, the government house leader. Of course, Mr. Speaker, she talked about uh, doing better on ventilation. We've, we've done that, Mr. Speaker. She talks about hiring additional teachers. We've done that. She talked about uh, hiring uh, additional staff to ensure that our schools are safe. We have done that, Mr. Speaker. That is why, in September, we were able to have our kids go back to, to school in person learning. But we also knew we had to give parents choice, and that choice was to be in, in class or online, Mr. Speaker, and we made the investments to make sure that parents have access to both, Speaker. That is what we have been doing since day one, since this pandemic hit, Mr. Speaker. We will not stop putting the emphasis on our kids, on the next generation of, uh, of leaders, Mr. Speaker. That is our priority, and we will continue to make students our priority. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government fails to understand that not all households have the same resources to support students learning at home. Words are not enough. Actions are what matters. And your actions are to cut $1.6 billion in priorities and partnerships funding, as the FAO reported just this week, and it shows the government's real intention. In hotspots, schools are in need of repairs and not set up to deal with an airborne virus that is mostly transmitted indoors and in closed proximity. There are real COVID learning gaps that are being developed, mental health risks for schools being closed, and things are not set up for a safe return to schools either now or in September. Speaker, the government has not made sure that schools are safe for in-person learning now, and it is cutting funding for the next school year Question. that should be invested in our schools. Does the Premier believe that this pandemic has had a worse effect on hotspot students? And if so, what is his plan to ensure that there are no learning gaps and that students in all areas of our province receive the supports that they deserve so there's no Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. Speaker, a strange question coming from a member who used to be the Minister of Education. Her question outlines why that member was such a failure as a Minister of Education. She, she says that we weren't prepared. She said that we, the schools weren't prepared to deal with the pandemic. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caution the Government House Leader on his language and uh, ask him to conclude his answer. Mr. Speaker, the question was that schools were not prepared in the province of Ontario for the pandemic. We began making those changes in 2018. The question was that our, uh, our educators weren't prepared. We started making those changes in 2018. I am very sorry that the Liberals find offence to the fact that their time in government was such a failure, but that is why the people of the province of Ontario turned to this government to put in place and to fix all of the damage that that party did, Mr. Speaker. I am sorry that they find that offensive, but the people of Ontario wanted change, and that's why they turned to us to fix the to order. Member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, we know that stricter border measures stop the spread of COVID-19. This reality is backed up by hard evidence and data. All the cases we have in Ontario can be traced back to an origin outside of Ontario. Only a few weeks ago, the first cases of the B1617 variant first seen in India were detected here in Ontario. Can the Solicitor General tell us the House 
more how this variant has spread and why it's important to keep restrictions on our borders. The Solicitor General to respond. And thank you for the uh, member from Oakville for raising this. I think it is really important that we continue to talk about what we're protecting our, our friends and neighbours from. We've consistently called on the federal government to enhance our safeguards at the border. Many of the new variants spread quickly, and the Indian variant, known as B161, variant has spread quickly. From May 12 to May 19, Public Health Ontario said the number of non-positive cases of the B1 Six one seven. Okay. Member for Waterloo, come to order. Government House Leader, come to order. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, come to order. Yes, you. Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. From May 12th through to May 19th, Public Health Ontario said that the number of known positive cases of the B1617 coronavirus variant grew from 45 to 260. It is almost certainly even higher today. From a few cases, B1617 spreads in a very short time period. We are making progress in Ontario, protecting Ontarians, but we need the federal government to step up and do their job as well. Member for Oakville, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And we are all aware of how the original COVID-19 virus got here. It was through travel, obviously. Yet some would have us believe that a few infected travellers is nothing to worry about, suggesting that travel accounts for less than 2% of the cases here in Ontario. Yet we know that every variant of concern that has filled our ICUs has come from outside Ontario. Back to the minister, can she explain how other variants are of concern and why stricter travel rules are necessary now to protect the people of Ontario? Thank you. Solicitor General. Thank you. And thank you again to the member from Oakville. We know that mobility is a factor in the spread of COVID, which is exactly why that is why we need to act now. On February 26th, the North Bay Perry Sound unit found 12 positive COVID-19 cases from the B1351 variant, also first discovered in South Africa. As of May 31st, we have a total of 949 cases in Ontario. It arrived here through travel, then spread. Once again, on February 8th, Ontario confirmed Canada's first case of the B1P1, also known as the Brazilian variant, in Toronto. The case was linked to international travel from Brazil. As of May 31st, we have a total of 2,867. On December 16th, Ontario confirmed Canada's first cases of the B117, known as the UK variant, in two individuals, two from Toronto. As of May 31st, we have a total of 126,707 cases. It's travelling into Ontario and the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, theatre goers were excited to see work nearing completion on a new outdoor performance space for the Stratford Festival. They and other arts organizations have invested millions towards a safe reopening. And like so many others in their sector, last year the Stratford Festival cancelled in person programming and pivoted to online engagement. This year, they and others, like the Waterloo Jazz Festival and Drayton Theatre, are ready to return to safe in person performances. We all need this to happen. What they need from this government is a thoughtful, individualized approach to reopening performance venues, including outdoor spaces. For example, they need permission to rehearse outside. You can't start in step two never having rehearsed in step one. This is advice from Mitchell Mar Marcus from the consortium. After the year uh, the performing arts have been through, the frustration is real and there are no provisions for rehearsals Question. in the new roadmap, which doesn't make it a very effective roadmap for the performing arts community. Will the Premier work with the Stratford Festivals and the performing arts community to ensure that they can open safely sooner than later. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thanks very much. I appreciate the member opposite's question, and it's one that we've been working on throughout the last 15 months with this sector. 
particularly with the Stratford and the Shaw Festival, as well as many other festivals across the province who have either been shuttered um, or who have, have, we were able to get some concessions in the previous uh, framework for them to be able to do online and virtual performances. Um, having said that, uh, there's a, a great inconsistency with the member opposite and her leader. Her leader is telling us to shut more things down. She's telling us to open more things up. We spent a lot of time with the Ministry of Health me and her spend a great deal of time with these sectors, in addition to the Jobs and Recovery Committee at Cabinet, with which we have an audience with um, Dr. David Williams. At this time, uh, they have said that uh, at the health table, we aren't prepared at that moment. We are right now in pre-step one. We would like to get to step one, and the quicker we get into step one, the quicker we get into step two, and Response. the quicker we get to see these performance arts centres back up and running. And that's something that I would love to see happen um, almost immediately, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you very much. We've asked for some common sense, Mr. Speaker. As pre pandemic, the Stratford Festival attracted 500,000 tourists annually, directly employed 100 people, created an additional 2,400 full time jobs. If we want to talk about restarting the economy, it needs to be inclusive of these arts organizations and businesses like the Stratford Festival. They can't just turn the lights on and call action without having the ability to prepare for that opening. They are simply asking for clarity and the rules of engagement, if you will, so that they can plan for a successful season. But they are running out of time. They also want clear communication from the government in order for their season to move forward, rehearsing outdoors and a flexible model to maximize capacity limits safely for audience. Can the government commit today to these reasonable requests and establish regulatory fairness for the performing arts sector? Mr. Heritage. As I mentioned in the previous uh, answer, the ministry is working with health in order to pro provide those guidelines. We have uh, established a, a table to try and make sure that we have a theatre strategy moving forward, the Stratford Festival obviously being part of that, as well as the Shaw, as well as others. Um, but again, I, I, I speak to the inconsistencies of the NDP. The leader at the beginning of this question period wanted to shut more things down and prolong the lockdown. And now this member opposite is trying to, uh, trying to open more things up. Order. We continue to work with the sector. In fact, we rep increased the funding to the sector by $25 million. And we gave uh, the Stratford Festival $1.8 million, and they said we are extremely grateful to the Ontario government for being so responsive to our needs. The Stratford Festival had Spons. to cancel its entire 2020 season, which had to bring in more than $70 million in revenue. Thank you, Minister McLeod, for supporting the arts and the artists in the province. We desperately need the stability this new funding order. offers. <laughs> member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The member for York Centre, come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. COVID-19 is a public health crisis that has required extraordinary government action. But Ontario has another public health crisis that is crying out for urgent government action. A recent report found that 2,050 people died of opioid overdoses between March and December of 2020. That's an increase of 75% from the exact same time period of the year before. Speaker, that is 75% more deaths. But instead of taking action, the Premier has refused to remove the cap on overdose prevention sites that he imposed in 2018. So I have a simple question, Speaker. Will the Premier act now to save lives by removing the cap on overdose prevention sites? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. The uh, opioid uh, situation is very serious in Ontario. It has been for some years, but it certainly has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, we are taking action. We have currently funded 16 consumption and treatment services sites, and there are still other municipalities that are still applying to become consumption and treatment services sites. So there's still room for others to apply. In addition to that, we have uh, made, uh, we've allocated up to $31.3 million for 21 CTS sites across the province of Ontario. And as part of our 
plan, our Roadmap to Wellness, our comprehensive mental health and addictions plan that was launched just before COVID struck Ontario. We have invested over $525 million more in funding, including $4 million for nurse practitioners Response. for detox centres, $8 million for addictions day and evening care, and $3.5 million for home and withdrawal um, uh, care of vans that can move across areas that are difficult to serve. There's more that I can say in the supplemental, but it's something that we do take very seriously and are working on right now. Supplementary question. Speaker, everything is not okay. Public health experts are calling for action. The Ontario Construction Consortium just came out calling for action because 30% of the deaths are construction workers. Yesterday, Ontario Northern mayors came out calling for action on the opioid crisis. Just last week, I met with the drug strategy team in my riding, one of those 16 cities that has an overdose prevention site. And they said, Mike, can you convince the government to remove the cap so other communities can have the kinds of harm reduction services we have in Guelph. And so with all due respect to the minister, speaker, I'm asking the government, will they remove the cap on overdose prevention sites and put more money into harm reduction services to help save lives? Minister of Health. Thank you. I, again, this is a very serious situation, and I can advise the member that there's no need to remove the cap because there are still um, municipalities that are applying. We funded 16. There's 21 that can be funded. Municipalities can apply and, and, and make their case to have more consumption and treatment services centres. But it's not just about that. I heard you speak about harm reduction. We need to have investments made across the entire continuity of care for people to make sure that we can have the consumption and treatment services site we need more RAM clinics. We need more um, safe places for people to live for residential treatment. There's a lot of work that has yet to be done. We are working on a plan now, and we will be releasing the details of it very soon. The next question, once again, the member for Oakville. My question uh, is for the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. We know that the government has been focused on helping small businesses save on utilities during this pandemic through supports like the property tax and energy cost rebate grant. Hardworking families in my community continue to look for ways to ease pressure on their bottom lines, just like our businesses try to make ends meet. Could the minister tell me how this government is helping families and individuals save on the cost of energy through supporting recovery and competitiveness act? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville uh, for his leadership uh, during these times in supporting small businesses across uh, his community. Uh, our government is developing a regulatory approach that will require electricity and natural gas utilities across the province to implement the Green Button Standard. The Green Button is a tool that will help Ontarians reduce their costs by finding new ways to lower their energy use. It also enables a market uh, that customers can choose from to monitor to make better decisions and choices about their energy usage. When consumers have access to real-time energy consumption data, they can identify and take immediate action, simple steps to reduce their energy usage. This data can also help consumers find and opt for long-term energy efficiency solutions. Ontarians Response. have been asking uh, for help to reduce their energy use and costs uh, for some time, and this will help deliver in that uh, goal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Helping hardworking families find ways to save money makes life easier during this difficult period, and empowering families to better monitor their energy usage will be a benefit long after this pandemic is gone. Can the minister tell the House how supporting Recovery and Competitive Act will help businesses across this province? Associate Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work on uh, cutting red tape uh, and reducing unnecessary burdens across the province to make sure Ontario remains competitive. To date, we have helped reduce the cost by over $330 million by focusing on regulatory modernization. 
We are modernizing regulations uh, so that it's easier uh, for businesses to understand and comply with uh, regulations. Uh, this pandemic has also proven that technology has been used uh, to save time and money, and this also applies to the not-for-profit sector. Virtual meetings have been a, a great example of this. That's why our government has continued through this act to allow for not-for-profit sector and corporations to conduct uh, virtual meetings indefinitely. We're making uh, government services faster, bringing more uh, services online to improve the user experience for many of these, not only consumers, but also businesses. Response. Currently, heavy truck, school bus, farm vehicle owners must renew their license plate stickers at a Service Ontario location. We are going to make the changes to ensure that they can do this online. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do whatever we can to support small businesses during this recovery. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. COVID hit and artists, performers, art workers were dealt a devastating blow. Jobs were lost, venues shuttered. My question is to the Premier. Roadmap to reopen leaves live arts behind. I am begging this government to accept the clear and evidence-based demands of the Fairness for Arts Ontario campaign and many other arts organizations like TAPA, MANO, PASO, CARFAC Ontario, demanding regulatory fairness on par with our good friends in film and television and sports. My question to the Premier is this. Will you allow artists and all performers to rehearse as soon as the stay-at-home order is lifted so they can prepare for reopening? Tarragon Theatre needs to rehearse. Will you reinstate live streaming and recording in venues as soon as the stay-at-home order is lifted? And will you outline clear percentages-based capacities indoors and distance-based capacities outdoors Question. so we can get our artists, our performers, our art workers back in building art, creating art, and helping their mental health? Please Thank you. Thank you. To, to reply, Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism yeah. and Culture Industries. Also for the great question. Obviously, uh, I have a, a very loud voice around the table, and I, uh, I really echo her comments. I really do feel that uh, parity is important, but at the same time, I recognize we're in a public health crisis, and we take our guidance from the Chief Medical Officer of Health and our health care professionals. Order. And I, I know that the Order. opposite. I don't like taking the advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, and they have undermined him consistently, but I do sit around a table with him frequently during uh, the week along with the Minister of Health, and we want to make sure— For Toronto, St. Paul's must come to order. The Minister of Heritage, please conclude your response. When we reopen, we reopen for good, and that's why the quicker we get to step one, the quicker we get to step two, and the quicker we can get uh, our artists back up and running. And I fully support the art sector in this process. The member for Toronto, St. Paul's is warned. Supplementary question. Member for St. Catharines. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. I have recently talked to several performing art communities in St. Catharines, and they are asking a simple question. The government's reopening plan has made allowances for film, television, and high-performing athletes to prepare, however, has left out the protocols for live performers to rehearse. It feels like the arts were unfairly forgotten again. There is a lot at risk in Niagara. They cannot magically appear on stage. They need to start rehearsing today. Organizations in my community, like Kate Leathers of Carousel Players and Rebecca Walsh at the Essential Collective Theatres, have said without rehearsals now, they are at risk of cancelling their summer season. This will be months of actors, musicians, and their tax not working. In Niagara, that means losing months of ancillary benefits to res restaurants and small businesses. The art sector is central to safe jumpstart our tourist economy. Minister, will you let performing art rehearse now like their counterparts in the film Question. industry so they can be ready to open on day one of stage two. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industry. Nothing more than I would love to see our performance arts up and running right here, right now, but we are in a global pandemic, and I am part of a cabinet and I am part of a team that takes 
the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health very seriously. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm shocked that this government, they never stand up when we invest an extra $25 million into our chronic, institution, our chronic arts institutions, or when we invested $62 additional million dollars into iconic institutions that include the Art ROM and the AGO. They don't stand up when we increase the budget to the Ontario Arts Council, but I'll tell you what, 15 months in, they're finally Order. asking questions about the arts, the culture. I'm waiting for sport, and I'm also waiting for heritage, and I'd love to have a question on tourism, because I've got to tell you, the hardest hit sectors are the sectors that are part of this ministry, and I find it galling that Order. they stand up only today, 15 months too late. The official opposition will come to order. The Minister of Heritage, Culture, Sport, come to order. The member for St. Catharines, come to order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Next question, member for Orléans. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Highway 427 is an essential project that was committed to and started by the previous Liberal government under the leadership of Stephen Del Duca. Now, this government only needed to maintain that progress. Highway 427 was meant to make lives better, create economic growth, and unlock potential. But lo and behold, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of this government, the highway is almost a year behind schedule. The Premier claims to be open for business, but he can't even open a highway. Moreover, he's kept residents in the dark, leaving the people of Vaughan, Caledon and Brampton uh, to hear about the status of the highway through media reports. So why all the secrecy, Mr. Speaker? Will the Premier come clean on when the people of York and Peel can expect this already finished Highway 427 to open? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, well, this is a commercial matter between the government and the contractor, and it's appropriate that Infrastructure Ontario handles disputes on a commercial level. As this dispute has recently been escalated to litigation, Mr. Speaker, I don't have anything further to say on it at this time. That said, our government is committed to delivering on ambitious infrastructure plans, which includes billions of dollars in transit and highways. Ontario is investing more than $21 billion in funding over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker, including approximately $2.6 billion in 2021 2022 to expand and repair highways and bridges. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all read the minister's love letter to the Premier in the Star this morning, but unfortunately, Highway 427 is still sitting there empty. The previous Liberal government already invested in this project and had shovels in the ground three years ago. Sorry, I'm going to caution the member on his language. That wasn't appropriate. Please conclude your question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Highway 427 is already a year behind schedule, but the Premier and the Minister are unwilling to deliver this piece of infrastructure to the families of Vaughan, even though the highway is finished. It's just sitting there waiting to be used, Mr. Speaker. Families are spending longer time getting home, all the while the highway is just sitting there. Member when will the government Hamilton finally Mountain open this important order. highway? When can the hardworking families of Vaughan expect their commute times to be reduced? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, well, as I said, this is a commercial matter and it's uh, subject to litigation, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment at this time. But I am heartened to hear the member opposite talk about the importance of investing in highways. He's an opponent of Highway 413 and doing the important work that we need to do to evaluate whether or not it's a project worth moving forward with. But I'm glad to hear that he's had a change of heart and thinks that we should be looking at investing in highways. Thank you. The next question. Member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Childcare workers in this province are at a breaking point. That's the takeaway from a recent survey of almost 2,000 childcare workers by the Ontario Coalition for Better Childcare and Association of Early Childhood Educators Ontario. More than half of the workers reported decreased job satisfaction during the pandemic, and 89% of workers re reported an increase of job-related stress. Childcare workers have gone above and beyond for children and their parents during the pandemic, but they are tired of being asked to do so much for so little. They're tired of being ignored by this government. My question to the Premier is, will you finally listen to childcare workers and make investments needed to raise their wages? To respond, 
Government House Stable. Yeah, well, I, I would certainly agree with the, the member opposite that uh, child care workers have been uh, so important throughout this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, uh, especially uh, uh, when you consider that uh, uh, they have also been on the front lines of ensuring that our essential workers uh, could continue to do their, their work, whether it was uh, being available for our nurses, doctors, PSWs, Mr. Speaker. They have done tremendous work, and I want to thank them uh, uh, for all of that work. We've made significant number of, of investments uh, in the sector. Uh, the member knows, uh, and I'm sure she would agree, that we, we certainly inherited a, a horrific system from the Liberals, just another part of the disastrous uh, uh, record of the previous Liberal government that saw daycare rates uh, uh, increase to some of the highest, uh, if not the highest, in Canada. There's a bit of, there is a lot of work left to be done in this sector, Mr. Speaker, because we know how important it is to families of, of the province of Ontario that they have choice, whether they want their kids uh, in, a, in an organized daycare or if they want the option uh, other options. That's why we brought in uh, a tax credit, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I understand that after uh, I think the, the federal government brought in uh, their first promise back in I think it was 1993 with respect to uh, to child care, they brought another one forward. Uh, uh, it seems to be like a, a liberal calling card, make a promise every single year and then never do it. But we'll work with them on this one, Mr. Speaker. We'll see what they have to say. Response. We'll see if they can actually accomplish anything, Mr. Speaker. We know that the previous uh, Liberal government, four administrations in 50 years, did nothing in this sector, but we certainly will. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we, all we hear from this government is thank yous, but thank yous don't pay the bill. Thank you is not a mental health service. And yes, they have, the, this government did inherit a sector that was in a bad shape, but they have actually made it worse. Improving wages and working conditions is important to addressing staff retention issues, something that has plagued the childcare sector for decades, and the pandemic has only made things worse. Almost half of the childcare workers in the survey said that they have considered leaving the sector permanently. If we don't pay childcare workers the wages they deserve, we will never be able to recruit and retain the thousands of additional workers needed to build a truly affordable and universal childcare system. Again, to the Premier. Will you work with the childcare sector to improve working conditions, and will you commit to implementing a wage grid that ensures no childcare worker is underpaid? Again, the government has to do. Mr. Speaker, we've been working with the sector uh, uh, right from the beginning, but especially uh, during uh, during the, the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, because we knew how important they were to ensuring that uh, that the essential workers could continue to do their their job, and they have. I'm not going to stop thanking them just because the opposition is tired of hearing uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to do that because what they have done Order. has been heroic and has helped us not only continue our economy in those essential areas, but more importantly, Mr. Speaker, they have helped us ensure that essential workers like doctors and nurses and PSWs could continue to do the job that has led us to getting some, over 9 million vaccines into people's arms, Mr. Speaker. That is, see us bring that curve down. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. There is a federal program, again, and I share the, the member opposite's uh, 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 worry as such. The federal Liberals have promised uh, uh, child care investments in the province of Ontario Response. since 1993. I was 23 at then. She, member opposite, probably wasn't even born when the first promise was made. The previous Liberal government was a catastrophe and did nothing on it, but we will continue to work with them and anybody who wants to make serious investment. Thank you. The next question. Member for York Centre. Speaker, to the government house leader, today we expect the province to announce if it will open schools. Yesterday I asked the Minister of Education why schools aren't open despite near unanimous advice, including advice from the Chief Medical Officer, to open the schools. I predicated my question on a December study from SickKids that approximately 70% of Ontario's children are experiencing increased anxiety or depression, and McMaster's Children's Hospital saying that its admissions for teens and kids attempting suicides have tripled. Now, the government house leader took the question and decided to make a mockery out of it. Between my social media platforms, his answer was viewed more Order. than 20,000 times with great interest and varying responses. So I'd like to follow up with the house leader why the schools aren't open, and specifically, was it appropriate for the government house leader to dismiss and make a mockery of the fact that more than 70 percent of kids are anxious and depressed and question. joke in the context of admissions for teens attempting suicide tripling in the city of Hamilton? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, <laughs> this member, the gall of this member, I've just said in this House on a number of occasions, I have two children, Mr. Speaker. I don't need any lessons from this member on what it takes to ensure that your kids have the, the, the ability to get through a pandemic, Mr. Speaker. The only person in this House 
today making a mockery of what we have faced as a province is the member for York Centre. He gets up in his place every single day. Yesterday we heard from the member suggest that it doesn't matter how he voted. That doesn't matter at all. The fact that he voted to ensure that the safety of the people of the province of Ontario in March, April, May, June, July, September, October, November and December, he said none of that matters. Those votes don't matter. I think the people in his community might find that outrageous to learn that when he Response. gets up and votes in this chamber, it doesn't matter because he's a flip-flopper. But for me and for us, it does matter. Supplementary. Speaker to the Minister of Finance. Last week I heard from an esthetician that she has no place to borrow anymore and that the only thing that's left for her to do is sell equipment. I heard from a constituent in the travel industry that he's close to being ruined. I heard from a friend in the entertainment industry that they cannot make ends meet anymore and they don't qualify for assistance. I heard from members of the beauty industry of multiple suicides. I'm hearing from various professional services that they're down 50 to 60 percent and then there are no more means to borrow. People are losing their homes, their marriages, their lives. Main Street Ontario is gone because this government failed to protect long-term care and added 200 beds, ICU beds, in 15 months and not one ICU nurse. But none of these businesses are responsible for any spread. And it's not COVID that killed these businesses. It's this government that's responsible for this catastrophe because of the Premier's quest for approval ratings. My question to the Minister, question. please don't talk about how important small business is and the various programs that don't work. Please save it and tell us, will you open Ontario? Uh, we will do so, Mr. Speaker, when it is safe to do so for the people of the province of Ontario. Unlike the member opposite, I and the members of this side of the House and the members on the opposite side of the House, with the exception of that member, care about the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario. We may disagree often, Mr. Speaker, but collectively we have worked very hard to ensure the safety and security of the people of the province of Ontario. The member's previous question highlighted all that he is about, Mr. Speaker. He's more worried about likes on Instagram than he is about getting his job done. He's more worried about how many people look at his Instagram videos than making his vote count in this House, Mr. Speaker. But I know one thing is certain. Next June, when the people of his riding have the chance to make a vote count, Mr. Speaker, they certainly will, and that member won't be sitting in that seat. That concludes our question period this morning. Member for York Centre, come to order. That concludes our question period for this morning. I'd like to remind members that the supplementary questions that they ask during question period should be consistent with the initial question and follow logically. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 288, an act to enact the building opportunities in the Skilled Trades Act 2021. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies.